This is a recap video of how I got on in the Druids Challenge 2023. Perhaps you're thinking about taking part in a future event. You want to pick up some extra tips from somebody who has taken part. Well, keep watching because I'll share with you all the things that I did quite well and all the things that I could have done a lot better. So what is the Druids Challenge? Which well, is a three day ultra marathon event along the Ridgeway in the UK. I'm not going to go about where it starts, where it finishes, where all the checkpoint finishes are. You can go to the X Energy website and get all that information. I will leave a link in the description below. It was about 87, 88 miles in the end, uh, over three days. Something I'd never done before. I wanted to push myself that a little bit further. I did call it an ultra marathon every day for three days. I mean, it's a bit borderline. It's just about over a marathon every day. And, and that tech means that it's an ultra every day. What was the terrain like? Well, we had lots of different woodland sections. We had sort of wide open spaces. We were literally running along the ridgeway, so to speak, uh, only ever occasionally through lovely little villages. And the first two days were beautiful weather. I had bright sunshine. And then on day three, it poured with rain. I mean, it is Britain, it is the, the winter. It is gonna be a bit of a, a gamble as to what you're gonna get. If you're gonna take part, then you're gonna have to pack and you're gonna have to take things with you that you're gonna need should it be raining all day long. Didn't have any problems with my feet, didn't have any problems with blisters. I wear in gingy socks, I wear uh, hilly toe socks. I also wear ultra running shoes, which are nice wide uh, foot shaped shoes. So I never have any problems with blisters. No problems at all either with chafing. I wear underwear and I use squirrel nut butter. It wasn't very warm, so it wasn't very hot. So I didn't sweat very much. So that was great, no issues there. I did, however, on the third day, get a bit of a knee injury. Um, I just think overuse, going up and down hills, not used to it. My knee basically said to me with about five miles to go, you're not running anymore. I tried to run and it, it was it was hurting. So I thought, right, fine, I'll just walk, I'll walk in. It was a bit miserable on the last day, so I didn't mind doing a bit of walking. I do need to go to a physio. It's not something that I've ha had before. It's probably gonna be rest and a few certain physio sort of uh, exercises, but I'm not gonna Google it and I'm not gonna do stuff that I might make it worse. I did feel dizzy uh, uh, towards the uh, the end of day one. Uh, at the time in the video, I said that I put it down and made a joke. It was, uh, I said it was, um, I said it was, uh, what did I say it was? I said it was altitude sickness. It, it obviously wasn't altitude sickness. I'm just not used to running hills. It was because I'd probably not eaten enough food. Uh, in the morning on day one, I woke up at half past two in the morning. I don't know why, there's no excuse for it at all, I just didn't fancy anything to eat before I left. I think I did the same at the Thames Pass, so I thought I could get away with it. I think I had a banana, but I really should have made myself have a decent breakfast before I started, and I don't think I would have felt dizzy on, uh, uh, on day one. I didn't feel dizzy on day two or three because I had a decent dinner, and I had a decent breakfast, and I was eating throughout the day. These multi-day events, even more so than a single day ultramarathon, is all about getting that food and that water inside your stomach. Yes, it can be difficult for some people. You have to find the things that work for you, but you have to keep putting the food in. And it's a late start on the first day. And so on the first day, you are gonna be running in the dark for a few hours, so you need it, you'll need a head torch. The day two and day three, you probably won't need a head torch at all. What they do is they put you out in three waves. Uh, so not everybody starts all at the same time. This is a very inclusive event, right? So they want walkers, they encourage people to walk the whole distance with poles. You can do all that sort of stuff. There's no cutoff times. So uh, the walkers and the slow runners start off at seven o'clock and then there's an hour break. And then the mid pack, the mid range runners, the people who are sort of used to doing ultra runners or have done the event before in the middle pack. And then there's a, there's a fast, uh, there's a fast group as well. So people who are, you know, there to compete, people who are very good, who've done it multiple times and are pretty good runners. It's so inclusive. It's really encouraging for any level of runner or walker, male or female. There were some great women out on the course, great walkers, great runners. There's no doubt in my mind, I think women are better at these multi-day ultra marathon events. And the longer the distance, the better they are. They are just so much more disciplined than men. They are just like machines. They just literally, right, I'm gonna run slow, I'm gonna walk slow, I'm gonna run slow, I'm gonna walk slow. There were some women in front of me, there were definitely 
definitely slower runners, but I just couldn't get anywhere near them because they were so much more consistently than I was. I would get to a top of a hill that I'm not used to running up, and they would literally just start running the second they got to the top of the hill. They were tired, they were going, right, I'm gonna go again, I'm gonna go again, and go again. And people, that's all you need to do. Find your own little rhythm, find your own little routine, and do what you like. The aid stations are spread out about sort of seven to eight miles each one. So there's about four, I think there's three, is it three on each day? All your needs are covered by the aid stations at the Druids Challenge. You've got loads of savory snacks, you've got loads of sweet snacks, you've got loads of orange squash, you've got blackberry squash, you've got Coke, you've got water, you've got pretzels, you've got sandwiches. I mean, everything that should keep you going for the next seven to eight miles, to be fair. You've had a breakfast and then it will just top you up and then you'll have a, an evening meal also provided by the crew. Uh, after day one and day two, you get you get to that end, end finish line on that day and then you get ferried back to where you are staying overnight. Uh, I think the first night was in a school and the second night was in a leisure centre or it was the other way around. You know, you don't run across the line and go into where you're staying. There are mini buses. Uh, whenever you come in, they sort of wait for a mini bus worth, like eight people. And then you just you get, you get driven to play your staying and your bag is already there in the hall. You have a showers, you can uh, get changed, you can relax, you can do some stretching. And then sort of about half past six, well, what time was the dinner actually? I can't remember what time the dinner was. The spread was, was fantastic. We had lasagna, chili con carne, there was a vegetarian option. And then somebody made some beautiful looking cake as well. And everybody loves a bit of cake, right? I don't know anybody that doesn't like cake, but the cakes were fantastic. The breakfast in the morning, Pretty basic, but you don't really want a massive cooked breakfast. There was a good selection of cereals. There was porridge, there was toast. There was lots of spreads for the toast. So I saw Nutella, honey, I saw peanut butter. There's probably jam there as well. There was bananas put on the table. There was water to fill your water bottles up. So let's talk about the overnight and sleeping in the hall because that was the part of the whole process, the whole event that I didn't know anything about that I was a little bit uh, apprehensive about, let's be honest. I would definitely recommend you taking a blow up bed or hiring one of the uh, camp beds that will be available to hire. I think it's an additional cost. Those people probably had a much better night's sleep than I did. I slept on a, uh, a mat, uh, didn't have a blow up bed, and I slept in a sleeping bag on a mat, and my cushion was a little, like a little settee cushion, like you put on the arm of a settee, a tiny little thing that I thought I was being very clever because it would fit in my overnight bag. The more comfortable you are, the, the better sleep you're gonna get, and the better sleep you get, the better your day's next day's riding is gonna be. So my massive tip is take a blow up bed, take a blow up pillow, and also for your sleep, uh, so an eye mask and some earplugs as well. It's a room full of 120 or 100 or so runners who've been running all day and that includes men and we all know that lots of more men snore and make a loud noise i mean that's how people sleep you know people can't help it they don't snore on purpose but you know just be aware that you are going to have to put up with sleeping with a hundred other people in a hall it was a bit chilly as well on the second night so i wore a hat i wore sort of like pajama sort of bottoms and a top wrap up warm keep warm take stuff that you're going to need and make sure you've got stuff to charge your own electronics as well because you, you want to know where you are you want to know where your gpx route is you want to know where the ridgeway is the ridgeway being the oldest uh footpath in the uk is really well signposted so you can't really go wrong i did go wrong don't follow runners follow the follow the arrows follow the acorns i did that twice and ended up going into the center of Wendover and following two runners who were going for a cup of coffee in Costa. But the Ridgeway is pretty well signposted, but I definitely had it uh, a GPX route put onto my watch, which you can download from the website. GPX for day one, GPX for day two, GPX route for day three. So definitely recommend you having that. I could have taken a really easy wrong, wrong turning on day three, I remember. And you know, I was keeping an eye on the elevation on, on the route on my watch. And if I hadn't have done that, I probably would have taken the wrong path and I would have been quite a, quite a distance off course. And after three days of run walking, that would have been disappointing. What else can I tell you that's gonna help? And that actually was it. Because after that moment, my battery died on my camera, but I couldn't really think of anything else to add to the hints and tips for the Druids Challenge. If there's something else you think I've missed or you have any further questions, then please just leave them in the comments below. I do answer every single comment. And for the very few of you that get this far on the video, 
Many thanks for watching. And here's some bonus footage for you. Here's me playing the handpan, because I'm still learning it and I still love playing it, over some of my favourite footage from the Jurage Challenge. So once again, thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video. Let's start that again. <laughs> Take two. There's no better time to be running through a wood than the autumn, is there? Wow. Stunning. So, lovely being here. This is why we sleep on the floor. <laughs> Look at this. Oh my god. Wow. Wide open spaces. It's a constant uh, mental battle running ultras. Go for it, man. Have a good one. Even in the darkest hours, got to have a quick look. Where have you been? Where are you going? We're getting there, we're getting there. That is the end, the finish line of the Jewish Challenge. Three days on the Ridgeway, three ultra marathons in a row.